Okay. The following interview was conducted with Thomas B. Robinson, Vice President for Student Services for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, April 1, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dr. Robinson. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Let's start where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born uh, actually on September 6, 1944 in Hagerstown, Maryland. And uh, I, we lived in, in Maryland until I was a third grader. And then when I was in the fourth grade, we moved to the Chicago area. And um, I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago in the town of Villa Park and went to a very large high school at Elmhurst, uh, Illinois, York High. And then after my first year at York, uh, my own town built a new high school. And so I was actually in the first graduating class of uh, a new high school, a very large high school. And it was a great experience. Chicago area was a great place to grow up and I had a great, uh, great time. I had a large high school. There were nearly 4,000 students in my high school and uh, over 1,400 in my graduating class. I ended up going to college, to a small private college in Pennsylvania, Juniata College. My family on both sides of my family had been from Pennsylvania and for, at that time, uh, five generations of our family had gone to Juniata. Uh, since that time, even more. And they started recruiting me when I was five years old and so by the time I was ready for college, I never thought about any other place I wanted to go. And all my friends in high school seemed to either be going to the University of Illinois or to Purdue. And I headed off back east and I had a great time uh, in college. Uh, I was involved in lots of different things. I was uh, uh, involved in sports. I was on the varsity tennis team. Uh, I was in student government. I was a resident assistant. Uh, I was involved in student newspaper. In high school, I was managing editor of my high school newspaper. And at one time, I considered a, a career in journalism. So when I got to college, I continued my interest in um, in newspaper work and communications, and I was uh, actually uh, started the first uh, college radio station. So I was involved in communications along the way. And what was interesting, uh, actually, my junior year in college, uh, the president of the college. Uh, How large was this? Tell us about the about th The college was about 1,100. It was a co ed. It was co ed, okay. private small liberal arts college. Pennsylvania has. Uh, well over 200 private colleges, and, and uh, this was a very good private uh, independent liberal arts college. Had about 1,100 students at the time. The president uh, was a person I knew. Our families had been friends for many, many years. Uh, he was nearing retirement age. He was a terrible driver, and he had been in some very serious automobile accidents. And so... He came to me when I was a junior and said at the beginning of my junior year and asked if I wanted to be his driver. And so I said, sure. And uh, at that time, he was serving on the Senate Subcommittee for Higher Education in Washington, D.C., when Hubert Humphrey, the senator from Minnesota, was the chair of that subcommittee. So I drove him back and forth uh, to the Capitol uh, a lot, and we spent a lot of time in the, in the car. Mm -hmm. And he turned out to be a wonderful mentor. That led to my driving the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Chairman of the Board of Trustees' name was John Baker, former dean of the Harvard Business School and president emeritus of Ohio University. At the time, he seemed very old. Uh, interestingly, he just died about six or seven years ago at the age of 103. But uh, a wonderful man, and he lived in North New Jersey, and so from central Pennsylvania to North Jersey, I drove him uh, a good bit, and he became a wonderful mentor. And so between the two of them, the conversation often would would revolve around what I was going to do after college, and, and I was interested in five or six different things. And one thing led to another, and they both encouraged me to think about a career in higher education administration. And so one thing led to another, and that's what I ended up doing. I applied to about eight or nine graduate schools, and I ended up uh, going to Penn State University, which had a very fine program. Uh, which was only about 30 miles from where mm -hmm. I was as an undergraduate. And uh, so I did that, and I had a great experience at Penn State, um, was involved in lots of different things, had a, worked for the university full-time while I was a graduate student uh, in student affairs, and um, had great experience. And uh, Penn State's 
uh, way of personalizing a college education at that time was to have residential areas for students and each area was like a mini college so it had residence halls its own student union its own dining halls a rec center post office that kind of thing and i hmm. was in sort uh, of a complex by its end yeah, it was and so i i managed i was responsible for those and i started out the smallest one and by the time i was finishing my graduate work i was responsible for the largest one and by the time I was a third year graduate student, I think I had a staff of about 48 or 50 people. And wow. so it was, it was great experience. And uh, while I was finishing my, uh, my doctorate at Penn State, uh, my alma mater, Juniata, was recruiting me to come back. By this time, the president that I had driven the car for had retired. Juniata had a new president. He was a Juniata alum. The former previous president of Wittenberg University in Ohio had come. And he heard about me, and so he was recruiting me to come back as his assistant. And so I ended up doing that. I went back uh, to my alma mater as assistant to the president. And that was a wonderful experience, and uh, and he ended up turning out to be a wonderful mentor Super. for That's me. What you so need. Yeah. so I, had, I had great uh, mentors along the way. And at the time, I was a young guy. I was right out of graduate school as a 25-year-old. Uh, I was wearing about five different hats. I was doing lots of different jobs, and I thought, boy, the college has really taken advantage of me. But in retrospect, it could not have been a better learning experience because I learned very early on um, a, lot of, a lot of things that have stuck with me uh, all through the years, and, and um, uh, it could not have been a better, a better learning experience. Yeah. Uh, one thing led to another, and after several years of doing that, the dean of students at the college ended up uh, resigning to take a presidency at another institution in the middle of the year. And so the president asked if I would take the job, and I said, no, I really didn't want to do that. I had worked at Penn State during the free speech movement, during the unrest of the 1960s, and uh, really wasn't interested in necessarily going into student affairs. And he what finally was, said... Yeah, what were some of your duties for the assistant to the president? Or I ran said? the president's office. He was okay. away a lot. Okay. Uh, I did 95% of his correspondence. I was the interface with constituent groups, with key oh. administrative staff on the, on the campus. Uh, he and I would meet every Saturday morning to go over all the things that I had done during the week. And I would show him all the letters that he had sent. Uh, and I always signed his name. I never signed my own. And after a couple of years, he finally said to me one Saturday morning, he said, I think I better watch my checkbook. He had a very interesting signature, but I had it down pat. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a great experience. Oh, I, I, I learned so. all kinds of things. And actually... And you interacted with a lot of key people. Well, I did. And, and uh, one of the things that new presidents often do is, is uh, reshape the administrative staff and structure. And so uh, early on, I was involved as, uh, in fact, one of the first tasks I had, this was back in the uh, late 1960s, uh, there were economic uh, issues that were especially hitting small colleges in a very hard way. And so one of my first tasks was to figure out how the college would save three to $500,000 uh, in a very short period of time. And, uh, that was a new experience for me, and uh, but it was a great learning experience. Uh, at one point then, uh, hmm. I was responsible for alumni affairs. At another point, I was the chief development officer. At another point, I was the chief academic officer. Uh, I was involved in institutional research and planning. Uh, wow. So all of these things really uh, were of enormous benefit to me, right. particularly in retrospect. Over your career time. Uh, right. As I think back uh, on my career and... and um, so I could not have had a better experience. Well, I ended up taking the job as uh, assistant, as, as dean of students, and I continued as assistant during that time to get through the academic year. And the college did a search, a national search, and one thing led to another, and t arms were twisted, and I finally accepted a permanent appointment. And that's how I really got into student affairs on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had a great career. I've been now a dean or vice president at seven universities. and. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, at Purdue, uh, this year I'm completing my 12th year at Purdue, but I'm also completing my 48th consecutive year on a college campus. And uh, it's been it's been a fabulous experience. Right. I wouldn't trade anything for that. What, what I, I know the most recent one was at um, um, Amherst, U, U of Mass. But where were, what were some of the other schools that you were? Yeah, well, I came to, I came to Purdue from uh, I was vice chancellor for student affairs at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and before that, I was vice president at Cal Poly University Pomona in California. And before that, I was vice president for student affairs, actually for student and university relations. At, the, at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. And before that, I was dean of students at uh, New England College in New Haven, Connecticut. And before that, I was dean of students at uh, New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire, and also Arundel, Sussex, England. We had two campuses. We had a, an international campus as well as an American and I was dean of both campuses. So those were days before the computer, before uh, a lot of the technology we have now, and either you did things by telex, by telephone, or airplane. And so I <laughs> commuted back and forth uh, a great deal to England. Uh, was that where the other campus was, in England? It was uh -huh. in England. It was in southern England in Arundel okay. and Sussex. So I've had a great time. Every institution has been different. They've been large, small, public, private, rural, urban. Uh, Purdue is my fourth land grant university. My, in the more recent years, I've been associated and have been serving land grant universities, so I've been very much involved in public higher education, and mm -hmm. uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. And over the years, I've had uh, great experience with fabulous students, wonderful colleagues, great faculty, and I wouldn't trade anything. So, what were some of the uh, uh, the other schools that you have? As many units, or did it vary with the institution? You've every, got quite a few reporting to you now. I do. Uh, every talk every, every university is different. When I was at uh, the University of Massachusetts, I actually had thirty four departments reporting to me. Uh, wow. I had I had a full range of uh, things That's that would lot. typically be in a student affairs portfolio, including all the residential life. I had public safety, uh, the fire department, the uh, police department, environmental health and safety, employee assistant program. I had a lot of things that typically aren't included. Uh, at Cal Poly, I, I had a variety of things too, and every place has been a little bit different. When I was at Montana State, I started out with a very uh, standard student affairs portfolio, but every time I turned around, the president was giving me more things to do. And before it was all said and done, I was responsible for uh, intercollegiate athletics, for the Alumni Association, for state relations, for university relations, uh, for development. Uh, and so I had a really broad portfolio Very uh, at, broad. Mon at Montana State. So uh, what I find uh, greatly satisfying is that every institution where I have been, I've been not only uh, allowed but almost encouraged to really transcend the traditional boundaries to really uh, become engaged. And what I learned very early on as a young assistant to a president was that everything we do in a university or a college is connected. One way or another, it's very difficult to make a decision in one area of the, of the, of the institution that doesn't have an impact somewhere else. And so something that's been very important to me over the years is the fact that uh, collaboration, partnering, uh, cooperation is absolutely essential. And as a matter of fact, now that we're in the 21st century, I think the university of the 21st century has to even be more connected than ever before. Right. And therefore, the kind of collaboration and partnership is just absolutely right. essential. Good point. Excellent. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about, now, I thought I'd ask you about your orientation. I thought this was kind of good. You came about the same time in Boiler Gold Rush. <laughs> Well, you I made did. a comment. You know, was in process. I'm the new person too, right? It was well, great. Well, I did actually. Yeah. Boiler Gold Rush was very, very in its infant stages as we know it now. Yeah. Uh, several years prior to that, uh, Purdue had an orientation program for Co new students, and yeah. it was called Corn, Corn Camp. Right, because well, I know people. We were involved in that. The library helped out a little bit. Well, with the you program. can imagine that there wasn't a lot of interest in Corn Camp, and there wasn't very <laughs> high participation in Corn Camp. So it was reformulated, and when I got here, we tinkered with it some more, and we did some things. In those very early days uh, of Boiler Gold Rush, we actually had a cap on the number of participants that we could um, do. This was a partnership with, uh, between Student Affairs, Student Services, and uh, University Residences, Housing and Food Service. Uh, other departments subsequently got more and more involved. And 
each year it started to grow. And uh, one of the things that uh, that I did not too long after I came to Purdue, actually it was in November of the year 2000, I completely reorganized all of enrollment management and um, including in that what we do, how we manage new student programs, orientation, boiler gold rush. And uh, at the time uh, we had a young fellow here who had been our director of admissions, Doug Christiansen, who was very, very successful in admissions, and I promoted him to be an assistant vice president uh, for enrollment management and dean of admissions. And working with Doug, we hired a, a new director for Boiler Gold Rush, and it just took off. Right. And every year it just grew and grew and grew to the point now where it's really taken on a life of its own. This past year we had I think we had over 5,400 new students participating. It's grown every year. It's grown every year, right. and we have, well now, it's it's turned out to be just not a program for new students. It's a great leadership program for returning students right. because we have returning students that come back and volunteer to serve as team leaders, and then we have another group that's involved in helping to plan and shape the program so that it really has become a student program now that students are very involved in helping to organize and right. manage, which uh, is just great, and I think it's one of the reasons that it is so successful. That's right. We have been very, very fortunate to have Boiler Gold right. Rush, and hopefully it will continue to really flourish. Well, it was nice that you were also part of it, too. Yeah, it was fun. It was, it was great, and, and, and really, to participate in Boiler Gold Rush and to see the enthusiasm, to go to Elliott Hall, actually, you can go to Elliott Hall anytime the whole group is there, but particularly on the opening night, the level of energy is just phenomenal. And um, uh, at the time, uh, we really got BGR going. Uh, by that time, President Jiski had arrived on the campus. Right. And I was trying to, we invited him to come and, and talk with the students. And I was trying to prepare him for what he was going to encounter when he got to Elliott. And he wasn't prepared. And he was just completely blown away by the enormous level of enthusiasm and school spirit. And this is definitely after four or five hours that students were on campus. And uh, it's pretty phenomenal experience. Sure is. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, what are some of the um, your strategic plan? Did you, ever, you got that going? Well, Everybody? we did. We got, right. um, as a matter of fact, when I came to Purdue, uh, and I'm finishing my 12th year, in student services, particularly in the vice president's office, there had been some transition and turmoil and so, uh, actually a fair amount of turnover. We had uh, a vice president, uh, Dick Grace, who had been in the position for uh, a, a period of time. When he retired, another person was, was here, but here only about 15 months. Uh, in fact, he never really moved into the office. His family never moved to town. And then he left to take a presidency at another institution. Tony Hawkins, our dean of students, then was appointed an interim right. vice president for a year. And then I arrived. And so by the time I arrived, I inherited a wonderful group of people, but they were reasonably unsettled. And they were not really focused. And as I visited with each one of them, they said to me uh, separately that they felt marginalized and they did not feel valued. So my message to them was, well, if uh, we're feeling marginalized, let's get off the margin. And if we don't feel valued, let's not worry about what other people think now. Let's worry about how we serve our students, how we do our jobs, how we connect with our colleagues, how we can support the academic mission of the institution. And I think that will ultimately take care of itself. So one of the things I did, uh, I, I quickly learned that uh, the, my department heads, they knew each other, but they didn't really know each other. And so one of the things that I had done when I was at the University of Massachusetts, I was heavily involved in the continuous quality uh, movement. And I had hired a consultant from Oregon to come and work with us at UMass. And we I partnered with another vice president. And we trained, oh, um, several thousand staff. And we made significant progress. And you have to understand that UMass is a very different kind of place than Purdue. In fact, from a quality of life point of view and from a campus climate point of view, it's probably the other end of the continuum. It's a very activist-oriented campus, and we had lots of issues constantly. Well, we made a lot of progress, and so I thought, gosh, if we can make that kind of progress at UMass, I wonder what we could do at Purdue. So I invited my consultant, her name's Joni DeMott, lives in Oregon. She works with not only higher education, but large uh, business and industry, the U.S. Navy has been very successful as a facilitator and is a real expert in continuous quality, but also facilitating uh, right. workshops. 
And I brought her in, and she spent a couple days on campus just mingling and learning to know my staff. And then I brought her back, and I, uh, I told my, my uh, department heads that I wanted to have a two-day retreat. Well, they were kind of lukewarm to that because what I learned was that in previous retreats, when they went, they always came away with assignments, and a lot of it was busy work, and they weren't really excited about all The focus was different. So it was definitely different. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, I, I, and fortunately, Joni and I had worked together long enough at UMass. She knew how I thought, and I knew how she worked. And uh, the very first day, we had some resistors to the, to the retreat. It was out at the trails. And... Uh, the first day I had some stragglers and they were just really resisting and you know, but whatever. Well, the first day went really well. It was a smash as a matter of fact. And what was interesting, the people who were the most resistant to begin with were the first ones there for the second day. And one thing led to another and we began to really talk about how we can work with each other and the fact that working together, it's not a zero sum game, that if we work together it doesn't mean someone's going to get more credit and someone else is going to get less credit, it means that actually we probably are going to be far more successful if we work together in a mutually supportive way than if we work separately. And one thing led to another. And over a period of time, this went on for a period of time, and we had a series of workshops and retreats. And Joni's been back on Purdue's campus almost every year uh, working one way or another with either uh, my entire group or with specific departments. And then she even started working with some student groups. We made enormous progress. And... Uh, there were a number of things that, that were very, very key to helping people think about how it is we work together in a more substantial way. One of the things I quickly learned before I even actually started officially at Purdue was that our student systems, were legacy systems, were terribly antiquated and needed to be replaced. And there had been uh, an enormous dialogue between my office, my predecessors, and then Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Bob Rinkle, about replacing the systems. And basically his message was, these systems have worked for 35 years. They'll work for another 35 years. Tell your people to quit whining and get back to work. We're not doing anything. Well, that wasn't the right answer because, as a matter of fact, our student systems were in terrible shape. They were, in fact, they were all homegrown, home-built, and the people that had been involved in really designing them were either had either left the institution or were dying or whatever, and so we didn't even have anybody to really yeah, manage yeah. the old legacy systems. So we kind of called time out, we regrouped, and over a period of six months, we were able to tell the story differently. And um, on a Saturday morning in the basement of Schliemann Hall, we had a fairly good-sized meeting to talk about the importance of replacing the student systems. And included in that meeting were uh, the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Bob Ringel, the Executive Vice President and Treasurer, uh, Ken Burns, along with a number of my staff uh, and some others. And uh, the uh, consensus at the end of that meeting was, we've got to replace our systems. Because, and it was an institutional obligation. Earlier, uh, I had been told, well, this is your problem. Your people manage this, so it's your problem. And if you want to change it, then you're going to have to figure out a way to pay for it. Well, my staff, many of them were stewards and still are stewards of the systems, but we don't own the systems. Mm -hmm. And these are systems that literally touch every person, every department on the campus that makes the university function. So we were able to tell that story differently. Unfortunately, and this goes back uh, to about 1999, um, the university had had some bad experience buying canned software. And so at that time, the judgment was Purdue can always do it better, so we're not buying anything, we're going to make our own. That led to the uh, decision to build our own and replace our own student systems, which led to a, to a, a software uh, enterprise that we called TRAX, T-R-A-X. Mm -hmm. And we made enormous progress in terms of the software, in terms of moving that forward. But frankly, I used that whole process as a way to really build cooperation and collaboration among my staff because, frankly, replacing that software had to be a collaborative effort. It could not be just one department, one area. It was something that everyone was engaged in. And we had a highly participatory group that was involved in the replacement of that whole system. We made a lot of progress. We moved forward. One thing led to another. It was at that time, uh, early on, we had separate uh, 
uh, information technology uh, uh, areas on the campus. It was before ITAP was created. Uh, one thing led to another, and soon after ITAP was created and the university hired Jim Bottom to be the first vice president for information technology, the decision was made to stop uh, production of the track system, start over, do something else, and rethink the whole thing. Well, that ended up happening, and that's what led ultimately, about three years later, to the initiation of the One Purdue uh, system to replace all of our software, not just student systems, but financial, HR, and ultimately development as well. And so uh, that's been going on. But er, in those early days with the, with the software, that was a great opportunity to really bring people together because it was a way to think about change, change management, doing our work differently. How can we more effectively serve students, but how can we more effectively serve colleagues and, and other departments? And um, it was, uh, while some would characterize it as not a very successful enterprise, truth was we were ahead of schedule, we were under budget, and we were making enormous progress. And I think it's unfortunate that the program was scrapped. But in any event, it was, from my point of view, a great success in terms of uh, using it as a tool to build teamwork among uh, people who were presumably here to really support students and help them be successful. Right. Good point. You're right. Let's talk a couple of things about, uh, one is that um, the Student Access Transition Success Program. Uh -huh. Make a comment on that. Sure. Well, one of the things that we did when I reorganized enrollment management and Doug uh, Christiansen uh, really was the person to oversee that area, we uh, really thought about how best to organize all of enrollment management. And so uh, that area started out much smaller and it ultimately morphed into what it is today and what you, what mm -hmm. you just described. Uh, it was primarily early on just new student programs, um, Boiler Gold Rush, the kinds of orientation things that we did, uh, and it was, it was pretty successful. Well, it became clear that as we got into working with special populations and doing early outreach, uh, we, the President Jiski started a, a, uh, a new program for disadvantaged students who had hardships and one way or another we were providing not only uh, support for them uh, once they were coming to the institution, we provided support after they got here. And we began to really rethink and retool uh, programs that were important. This was kind of on the heels of what previously had been included under the Lilly Retention Initiatives, which had previously been on the campus. And so we were keeping a number of those things uh, in place. Drew Koch, who was uh, instrumental in really managing a lot of the Lilly Retention Initiatives, ultimately was brought over and really was, became a part of Doug's organization and actually was a part of a, a unit that ultimately came uh, what we now call SATS. Right. And uh, when we had a, a, some departures and a change of personnel, actually Doug appointed uh, Drew to be the director of that area. And that has now become a very important area dealing with not only our new student programs, our Boiler Gold Rush, but all of our learning communities, uh, the kind of learning centers that we have to provide uh, learning support to right. special populations on the campus, working with 21st century scholars in the state of Indiana, um, really reaching out and augmenting the kind of work that happens all over the campus in terms of early outreach. And right. so that has been a very, very successful program. All right, good. Another one was the um, that student services technology and assessment. Well, yeah, I, uh, I had a unit, I have a unit now in student services uh, that really has been involved in a lot of information technology providing support to uh, desktops, but also uh, really providing a tremendous interface with now ITAP, working with departments with special needs with, with software that is particular to a particular discipline or area. Uh, and Lee Gordon, who had previously been involved in, in the technology side, I promoted, and he's now uh, oversees uh, assessment and technology uh, for student services. Uh, the technology piece has gone very, very well. There's a very high regard uh, and response from our customers in terms of customer service. 
Uh, so the support that we get for our desktops and for all of our hardware is very good. Lee has a special talent because he's also very familiar with software. So we've been also uh, able to advise and work with department heads as they are getting uh, software that's particular to their particular area. We really got into the assessment um, area in big measure several years ago and and of course in higher education there's over the years been increasingly a call for accountability in terms of really mm -hmm. documenting what we're doing and what are the learning outcomes and so we've been involved in assessment and as a matter of fact um, students spend more time out of class than in class uh, I don't think the out-of-class experience should be a free-for-all, so we offer a fair amount of structure and many opportunities for students to be engaged out of class. So there are many learning opportunities uh, out of the classroom, and we think this is really important as a way to extend and augment what happens for students in the classroom. So we also designed uh, an enormous array of leadership programs, formalized leadership programs, in addition to the informal leadership opportunities that have students have through our 878 student organizations and our many fraternities and sororities and our honoraries and many different groups uh, on the campus. One of the things that we started was an assessment tool uh, for students, a student uh, uh, satis interest and satisfaction survey um, which goes out in the spring. In fact, we're doing it at this time of the year right now on the campus. Uh, this is a fairly lengthy electronic survey of students. We do add incentives for students to complete uh, the survey and return it. We offer some pretty good prizes. Uh, in the past when we've done this, uh, we started every year. For the last couple of years we've been doing it every other year. Uh, we've had a, anywhere between a 42 and a 44 percent response rate, which is very good for that kind of a survey. The Student uh, Importance and Satisfaction Survey was not intended as a public relations document. It's really intended to be a document for department heads and staff to really look at the way in which they are delivering services and those deliveries are being perceived by students so that we can take steps to figure out better ways to provide the kind of support and service to our students. And that has been a very important uh, enterprise. Um, it really built on the strategic planning process. Uh, when Dr. Jiski came uh, 10 years ago now, he was very uh, keen on uh, pursuing strategic planning for the university because of the work that I had been doing with my staff on continuous quality and learning to really do our work differently and partnering anyway we were really poised to really move right into the strategic planning area and so interestingly we were the first uh, executive area that the president approved a strategic plan for after we really got that process going. And much of that includes assessment. And so uh, what we've been doing is really uh, following along. No one in the country really has an answer to truly figure out a way to accurately assess learning outcomes in the classroom or out of the classroom. But we are doing more and more of that kind of work. And one of the things that we're trying to do is work with our academic colleagues, our faculty colleagues, to, to really partner and provide mutual support because the line between what previously had been academic and what had been non-academic, that line is increasingly blurry. And so now it's really difficult to say, well, something's academic and something isn't. Now we really think about learning outcomes from a holistic point of view, and those learning outcomes are very broad, and, and uh, in student affairs we have, I think, a, a tremendous amount to contribute to really demonstrate the quality uh, of the institution and the success that students right. have. Yeah, good. Let's talk a little bit about enrollment management. Uh, you're breaking the records, it's even projection. But one thing I want to ask, as a state-assisted institution of higher education, whose mission is to provide the college experience for the sons and daughters of Indiana. How, how is the criteria used to manage enrollment management? Is there criteria for it? or Well, enrollment management is really, uh, in the for past, state in the, and, I will and tell management. you, when I came to Purdue, when I came to Purdue uh, in 1998, from an admissions point of view, uh, when we'd go out and recruit students, we'd recruit any student we could find. We kind of threw a great big net out, and then we'd reel our net in. And whoever was in our net is who we accepted, and you know, ultimately we would hope that they would come to Purdue. Well, there are some problems with that. Um, we have programs 
at Purdue, certainly, uh, and engineering is a good example, which represents a cyclical field uh, in the workforce. And when the uh, what we don't want in universities is to have enrollment to fluctuate. So we want to have stability. One of the things about enrollment management is it's very you can't really do enrollment management unless it's very definitely tied to strategic planning because it's predicated on the goals that the institution has. And so there are, there's a method to it. Uh, we use data a lot, and we have a lot of data to support decision making, how we use our resources, where we recruit, how we recruit, the kinds of publications we use, how often we send them, the colors even. We've pulled focus groups together to even talk with us about what colors do you resonate with? And and there are some publications that that we know are attractive or we want to really focus to students. On the other hand, there are, there are pieces of publications that we would really focus to parents. And those are going to be different. And so then it's a matter of using new technology. And how do we communicate? And where does it fit with email? And where does it fit now with Twitter? And where does it fit with all these other new forms of, of really technology that students are really apt to uh, to use, and one of the things we're trying to figure out right now is what junior high students are going to be using by the time they're ready for college, because we've got to be well prepared for to communicate day. with them in that way. So, when we reformulated enrollment management here, there was a very definite design. It was predicated on our strategic plan. There were very definite goals from an enrollment point of view, from a diversity point of view, from an academic quality point of view. Um, from a financial point of view, there are a whole variety of measures. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we really found a wonderful niche. And we've had a very, for the last decade, really the last 11 years, we've hit every goal that we had almost absolutely um, in going in a positive direction. That's not to say that we can't always strive to do better, sure. but in terms of meeting the fundamental goals, uh, it's been very important because one of the things we find is that as we're interested in getting a much higher quality student, let's say, with a higher academic profile coming in, uh, it also means that we may have a conflicting or a, a, a problem with a, a goal toward diversity. Uh, unfortunately, in the state of Indiana, uh, the number of underrepresented students are not that great. And so uh, for Purdue to compete for the very top students, the numbers just are not there. And it means that that uh, we have competing or conflicting goals that we really have to manage. And so we had set up a, a mechanism to really think about how it was that we wanted to, to achieve this. Let me just tell you a very quick story how, how a lot of this evolved. One day, uh, my registrar, uh, who is now a vice president at uh, the University of Kansas, uh, handed me a sheet of paper and I looked at it and it was the chart with Indiana birth rates for the next 20 years. And I said to Marley, so, so what is this? And she told me, what's well, the birth rate chart? I said, why are you giving this to me? She said, well, I gave a copy of that to budget and fiscal planning, and so I thought I'd better give you a copy of it. I said, okay, so I kind of looked at it, and I didn't really think much about it, put it on my desk. A couple of weeks later, my chief business officer for student services came back from a meeting with her colleagues, and the message was, what is student services going to do when we have a dip of enrollment in three years because we're going to lose some revenue when we have a dip in enrollment? And I said to my budget person, but we're not going to have a dip in enrollment. I'm working with the director of admissions um, to really think about things that we do intentionally to stabilize enrollments, and I used engineering as an example. At that time, we were looking at the Lilly retention programs as a way to increase the retention rate on campus. So here we are stabilizing entering freshmen, hoping to increase retention. I said, we're not going to have a dip of enrollment. I said, where has this come from? Well, then it started to click in my head and I went back to the Indiana birth chart rate chart. So I got my director of admissions and my registrar together with me and we sat down and talked and what was interesting to me was it was quite clear that the two of them didn't talk. They didn't really communicate. They didn't really work together on a lot of these issues even though they both had different sides of the enrollment sure. picture. And so one thing led to another and I decided I would go see 
my friend Ken Burns, the executive vice president uh, and treasurer, and I can remember it was late in the afternoon on a Thursday, uh, about 5 o'clock, and I went over to his office in Hovde Hall, and he had just come back from the president's office, and interestingly, he had that piece of paper in his hand. And I said, that's why I'm here. And he said, you don't understand. We like to budget conservatively at Purdue. And I said, well, you can budget as conservatively as you would like, but wouldn't you like to use real data? That doesn't mean anything. It has nothing to do with our enrollment. As a matter of fact, because we're working to stabilize incoming student enrollment, uh, whatever your birth rate is, it, it doesn't matter because we're doing things intentionally to mitigate against that. And besides, look at the number of students we're getting as non-residents coming from contiguous states, and those contiguous states are not having a decline in the birth rate. So this doesn't make sense. If you want data, I can show you some real data that would help you think more carefully about the budget and how you might want to budget. And he kind of looked at me. So one thing led to another. And I suggested to Bob Ringel at the time and then to Ken Burns that if they would be willing to come together and talk about this. Well, they didn't want to meet together. And they wanted to meet separately. Well, it didn't work out. And finally, I said to them, wouldn't just this one time, wouldn't you come together and let's sit down and, and we, can go sh we can show you exactly what we have and show you how this data could be helpful to you. We did that. That was the start of what we now call the Enrollment Management Planning Group, the EMPG. And what it was, it was a, we started a very small, but then we continued to add anybody who had anything to do with enrollment came and participated in that meeting. And uh, it was certainly the, the provost, the executive vice president treasurer, the vice president for business services, the director of budget and fiscal planning, the director of admissions, the registrar, the vice president for housing and food service, um, director of financial aid, anybody that had anything to do with any of these things were invited. And we started, we had a meeting uh, after that first one, and I can remember uh, uh, a couple people said, well, gee, this is really interesting. Wow, we can see exactly where you are. In a couple weeks, you might even have more information that would be even more definitive about what's coming. I said, yes, that's true. Well, could we meet in two more weeks? Well, of course. So we did. Well, we started meeting in a, a succession, and one day I get a call from Steve Baring, who was president at the time, and he said, I hear about these meetings that you're having. He said, I'd like to come to the next one. I said, great. So the president came, and it was a great opportunity to sit down and talk about issues related to recruiting students and retaining students because there are a lot of misperceptions out there in terms of what goes into all of this, how much work it really takes. Uh, it's not just by chance. And it was a great opportunity to really uh, help colleagues understand what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it. And uh, as I say, that then became kind of institutionalized and uh, we really created a niche for for Purdue that has been very, very successful over the last decade. And so it's been a very important element and enrollment management increasingly for every university in the country now has taken on a level of importance uh, because more and more even large universities like Purdue are tuition revenue dependent. We used to be dependent on state revenue. Well, not anymore. I mean, you know, now our tuition and fee revenue far exceeds what we get from the state sure. of Indiana. Yeah, so good. the stakes are high. It's been very important, uh, and it's been uh, really interesting to watch all of this progress. Right. Yeah. Do you, the um, any uh, the infrastructure? I want to talk a little bit about that. The recreational sports center. That's. Uh -huh. on the boards now. We've got we've got in student services we've got a number of capital projects that are that are very important. The Rec Sports Center is one of those. Um, people may not know that Purdue was the first university in the country to build a building specifically for recreational sports back in the 1950s. Uh, we kind of led the way in recreational sports. We have a long history in recreational sports. Soon after I came to Purdue we opened, we built and opened the Aquatic Center, the Boilermaker Aquatic Center, and that's at one end of the building, it's state-of-the-art facility. And then uh, in about uh, 2000, 2001 perhaps, uh, we built, I, I secured a, a million dollar gift from a donor in California, an alumnus, and we renovated and built a new fitness center uh, in the basement of the Rex Is that center. the Ishmael Center? No, it's oh. called the Colby Fitness Center. Oh, okay. The Ishmael Center is in, in Lambert. Oh, okay. 
And so the Colby Center was opened, and unfortunately we outgrew it the first week we opened it. So here we have state-of-the-art facilities, a small fitness center, a fabulous aquatic center, and in between a building that kind of looks like the 1950s. It kind of feels like the 1950s. It's terribly antiquated. A couple times we've added on a gym or whatever, but it really didn't meet the needs of our students. Recreational sports at Purdue is very important. Uh, we have over a million student visitors to the Rec Sports Center a year. And this is very important because this is a great destination spot for our students to go and have fun, work off energy, get good exercise, lots of different kinds of activities through group sports, individual sports, fitness, uh, dance, all kinds of aerobics, all kinds of things. Uh, if we don't have that kind of a facility to meet the student needs, uh, students will work off their energy but it will be in ways that we would not like to see and so I'm very interested in, in having a good rec sports center. Well, rec sports has been an issue for our students for the last number of years and this has been their number one issue to improve it. I hired a new director of recreational sports about four years ago, uh, Howard Taylor. When Howard came to Purdue in that very first year, we commissioned uh, an, a firm to come and do a major assessment of our indoor facilities and outdoor facilities. Uh, based on the assessment that was made and the recommendations that came out of that consultancy, uh, we had some options. Um, build a new building, tear that one down, do something else, but we clearly needed to do some things. Uh, this has evolved now over the past several years and students have been involved at every step of the way and this has now become a student uh, initiative and uh, students mm -hmm. said they fully recognized that to fund it uh, they would have to pay more student fees but they were not opposed to that as long as they got something substantial in return. So students have now been involved with the architects at every stage. Uh, we're about ready to start construction. As a matter of fact, as soon as commencement is, is over this spring, we will begin uh, some construction and some utility work. Major construction will begin next winter. But uh, this is going to be a phenomenal facility that will more than double the space. Uh, it's a $98 million project. Mm -hmm. uh, it is going to be phenomenal for the entire community, not just students. It will be very really important to faculty and staff as well, but we're very proud of that capital project. Another project that we've been working on, and I've been working on this one for 11 years, uh, is a new boathouse for our crew team. Purdue Crew has been around for more than 50 years. Uh, it is very successful. If there were a national ranking every year for crew, we would consistently be in the top 15. Uh, we have a very, very fine program that has been rowing out of a boathouse uh, not far from Fort Wiatnon. Uh, when there's a flood, uh, the boathouse is underwater. Uh, it's not very satisfactory. So we've been working on this. I've been trying to raise money. We've been doing it for 11 years. Uh, we now have a boathouse that is about uh, two weeks away from being completed, and it's down uh, on Wabash Landing. This is a collaboration with the city of West Lafayette. The city has purchased the property. We've raised the money for the building. We're putting a building, it's a $1.7 million project for, for the university, for Rec Sports. We're putting that building up. Um, it will have a, a number of bays for our crew team and a fitness area, a lobby area, a lounge area for guests. It'll be a great facility. It's a wonderful facility. It will also have a community bay for uh, the people of West Lafayette so that we hope to encourage community rowing, high schools to get involved, uh, community rowing of one sort or another. And so I'm quite proud of that project and that one will be finished uh, by April 15th. Another project that we'd worked on for a period of time was a new drill field for our university band, the All-American Marching Band. They used to practice out on the gold fields uh, by the intramural fields and they would slog through mud and wet uh, it didn't matter what the conditions were, right, were and there. in the process we would have a lot of twisted ankles and uh, it wasn't very satisfactory and one thing led to another and through the generosity of several very uh, fine band alums 
we were able to uh, to build a new drill field uh, just adjacent to the Rexport to the Aquatic Center, actually, and that's been operating. We had that fully operational this fa this past band season, mm -hmm. and that's worked really well. So that's a, a great one. Another uh, wonderful capital project that we're working on that I'm hoping to finish within the next uh, several months. The funding for is a new building for Purdue musical organizations. PMO is perhaps the best uh, group of student ambassadors that we have at, at Purdue. The quality of music is just phenomenal. The way in which our Purdueettes and the Glee Club connect uh, with our alumni and friends is just phenomenal. We've got other ensembles as well that are just doing really well. And uh, we have a very, very uh, generous Purdue alum who is the lead donor for that building. And uh, our hope is that we will be able to complete the fundraising for that building uh, within the next couple months, get it started, and that building will be located in the corner of Grant and Northwestern. So it will have a very prominent spot Grant. just across from Noy Hall. And uh, there's a fraternity house in that corner. It's kind of a triangular right. lot at this point that will be raised. We'll build a new building. And for people coming into uh, West Lafayette from across the bridge, uh, PMO building is probably going to be one of the first things they see when they come. It's going to be a phenomenal facility for them. So we look forward to that. And then there's one other project that, uh, that I'm working on, and that is uh, in conjunction with President Cordova. And this is a project that comes out of the strategic plan, New Synergies. Uh, the President had talked about a student hub. Uh, an opportunity to bring student services and different kinds of, of uh, functions together in one place. Uh, she asked me to start meeting with a group of students uh, to talk about that kind of a project and the focus. It, is, it was included in the Tiger Team report on student success, and then that led to the uh, actual the strategic plan itself, new synergies. It's included in that. And I have been working for this entire academic year with a group of student leaders to refine that focus. Uh, the students have now written a white paper. Um, architects have been selected for the project. A project manager has been appointed. And the president at the Board of Trustees meeting uh, next week will be taking the project for their approval and also seeking approval of the architects. That's a project that uh, probably will happen at the corner of Third and Russell Streets uh, across from the Black Cultural Center. And so that's a very exciting prospect for students because it would bring together academic elements that are related to student success, learning centers, uh, satellite areas for writing labs, math labs, that kind of thing, uh, having an opportunity, a triage desk to deal with issues related to tutoring, Codoing, all mm -hmm. kinds of academic programs, uh, as well as providing great opportunity and space for the leadership programs that we have and the many student activities and organizations that we have at the university. That would be really so we think that's going to be a very special uh, opportunity. The students are very excited about it. This is a priority for the president, and uh, we will be interested to see how that project right. unfolds. Sounds good to me. What about family? Um, um, we got, we got um, talk a little about family, and then we're going to talk about awards. Okay. Yeah. I've got I've got uh, a we wonderful family. Music. I've got a great wife, uh, Nancy, who uh, is a reading specialist by uh, by training. She uh, has had a wonderful career on uh, of her own. Unfortunately, as we moved around the country, she's been the one that's really sacrificed more than I have. And so the good news is that she's very flexible, and because she's talented, she's been able to do a variety of things. And uh, I'm very proud of the accomplishments that uh, that she's had in the world of teaching. We've got two boys; uh, they're grown. Uh, we became grandparents for the for the first uh, time about ten days ago. A little girl, and for being a family of boys, uh, having a little girl join our family is very exciting. <laughs> Boy, is she going to be so? Uh, we're looking forward to uh, to learning to know our granddaughter. Uh, both of our our sons uh, live in San Diego. So we're looking forward to moving to California this summer to be closer to our to our family, and and uh, we're excited about that prospect. Good. A couple of awards that you got. I think this is pretty nice. The um, you're a Purdue sire. I am a Purdue sire. I That's was, very nice. I've been I've been asked. I've been associated with the uh, with the Glee Club the entire time that I've been here, and I've worked very closely with with the. Uh, 
the leadership group, the SERVs in, in the Glee Club, was named to Purdue Sire. Uh, my wife and I have actually hosted four international trips for the Glee Club all over the world, and so we've learned to know these guys pretty well. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. We've really enjoyed our association with PMO. They are a great group of, of guys. While they make great music, they learn a lot of other things than just learning good music uh, right. in that process. But I'm proud of that. I was, I'm very fortunate uh, just uh, several weeks ago at my national convention, NASPA, which is the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators, which is the uh, National Association for, for Professional Staff and Student Affairs. I was, they, they named me a pillar of the profession. And uh, uh, that was a nice honor that I appreciate very, very much. And uh, so I'm pleased to have that. And then just last year, University Bands uh, presented me with their Block P Award. And I'm proud of that award. They actually gave me a very nice plaque, but they also gave me a baseball bat. Uh, to commemorate the number of times that I've gone to bat for them. So uh, uh, it's, I will take that with me, it's, right? <laughs> it's been really fun. Yeah. So I've been, I've really had great opportunities at Purdue, and yeah. I've been uh, inducted into a number of honoraries, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I'll leave it in to, for closing for you. Any, uh, I know you've said you're going to California, but anything that I forgot to ask? No, I, yeah, I've, I've had a great time. At P Purdue is a wonderful university. This is just a great university, and, and uh, I've, it's been a real privilege to serve Purdue. I work with wonderful students. I wouldn't trade our student body for anybody. I've got the greatest staff in the world. I have absolutely fabulous department heads. and. Um, a staff that is very committed to supporting students and help them be successful. And then uh, to be in an academic environment where we have a world-class faculty uh, has just been uh, a wonderful experience. We have great support uh, for the kind of experiences that students have. And, and of course, our primary goal is to really give students the very best experience that they can have while they're at Purdue, because if they have a great experience now, Hopefully, they're going to be a part of the Purdue family for the rest of their lives. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. I appreciate that. Very good. <clears throat>